so I've had a company, the Center for Creative Emergence, for since 1999, uh, and it is about using applied creativity for personal transformation, uh, organizational transformation, work transformation, and social transformation. And I specifically focus a lot working with entrepreneurs to help them structure their business around what's most alive for them using a lot of whole brain creative processes. And I work with organizational leaders and teams around um, meeting their business needs using a lot of whole brain creative process. And also the principles of creativity and principles of emergence and uh, principles of improvisational theater. And so I weave a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different modalities together to help uh, accelerate the uh, change process, basically, in the okay. creative process. Right. Part of what I actually focus on is helping people create their unique signature work uh, that I work with. So I'm hoping that I've done that in my own. Um, it's different because of my own life experiences. So I have focused a lot on emergence and I weave in some of the what I've learned about systems thinking and complexity sciences, along with what I've learned in being in improv theater for 20 years. And I used to perform full length improv theater uh, plays in the DC area. And uh, with uh, organizational storytelling, with visual thinking, with um, more um, left brain linear creative processes. So I think what's unique is my integration of it. And also having been doing this now, having done this for 20 years, there's much I've learned through learning what not to do that has helped me. So I have sort of patterns that I begin to observe that work and that don't work for engaging people in creative process and, and applying it practically into their business objectives. For example, one pattern that I have seen that shows up uh, almost in every creative process and in, in the beginning of my work, work life, I didn't really know how to work with it, but then over time I've learned how to, is a concept of natural resistance. Um, and I call it natural resistance because it's the resistance found in all of nature. You know, it's where the, the shell of an egg bumps up when the chick is ready to be born, bumps up against a new birth. So there's a natural dynamic tension, a resistance between trying to maintain the status quo and the new birth. So that is a pattern of emergence, that there's going to be a dynamic tension between one part trying to maintain and one part trying to be born. And that happens individually with us. It's, it shows up, you know, when all of a sudden you have a great idea or some, some kind of new paradigm idea for yourself. And then you have all this resistance telling you why it won't work. It happens in organizations and it happens in nature. So my view is rather than seeing it as a bad thing um, and um, fighting it, it's seeing it as part of the natural creative emergent process and learning to work with it. The same way a mother birthing a baby learns to work with both the um, contractions and the expansion, you know, as the, the baby's being born. Um, I find that that's one of the patterns, um, working with natural resistance, acknowledging it, and um, honoring it as part of the creative process. Okay. That would be one example. Oh, uh, I would say a both and to that. Um, I think there are some similar overlapping um, patterns that happen with everyone, uh, individually, small groups, small organizations, teams and organizations. And then I think there are some distinct differences. Uh, how, um, how uh, creativity emerges in a group can look different because there's so many different creative styles than how it might emerge in an individual. Uh, and each individual has their own unique creative style. So I think as a facilitator of creative process, you're always balancing that need to honor the individual unique creative styles of each person in the group, which in some ways is easier when you have a smaller organization. Um, uh, with the larger uh, goals of the team and the goals of the organization. Uh, and, um, and with the similar kind of vision or whatever that they're working toward or creating. So 
I would say that I, I, when I go work with organizations, I don't see myself as working with an organization. I see myself as working with um, a set of creatively alive individuals working towards similar objectives. And um, that happened to fit the objectives of the organization. And so that way, and I try to honor, uh, try to set up experiences that the uniqueness is seen as something valued and value added that can contribute rather than trying to reduce everybody to being on the same page or thinking the same way. It's more of a, um, rather than going into consensus, it's more of a, yeah, from improv, it's more of a yes and to expand what's possible. Bringing in the unique, the diversity of thinking styles, the diversity of experiences, the diversity of cultures, the diversity of everything toward creating something um, more, a little bit more unpredictable, but the next level of um, effectiveness, the, mm. the next level. Okay, you talk about diversity and very often people, you know, there's a consensus about diversity being a good thing, but research has shown that too much diversity can in fact be counterproductive because when you have people working in a team and their interests and their skills are too divergent, they don't, they're not as productive as when they are able to work in groups where they have shared expertise. So for example, in academia, if you get a group of scientists with a similar interest working together, they will tend to produce something and be a lot more effective because they don't have to explain things that each other understands whereas when they are in multidisciplinary teams and there's like there isn't that shared knowledge and understanding nothing well very little seems to get done so do you think that there's an optimum size for a team in terms of diversity um uh, i I'm, I'm not sure there's an optimum size in, in terms of diversity, but I would, I would make a distinction between a shared body of knowledge with, for example, an academic team would all have a similar body of knowledge and diverse creative styles. So I wasn't speaking as much to uh, just random diversity as much as you might have a shared, shared set of objectives, a shared set of goals, and a shared set of body of knowledge, but some people are more internal creative processors. Some people are more external. Some people um, get more from having some space to go inside, whereas some people need more um, ideating and brainstorming. And what I have found um, through just the practical working with hundreds of organizations and some academic teams and nonprofits and agencies is that uh, when I used to try in the beginning to get everyone creating, whether, whether they were a multidisciplinary team or um, had, a, had a, a very strong shared knowledge base, when I would get them creating in a certain way where everyone was expected to do things the same, to create the same way, it was much less effective than when I would allow the big, for example, the big, uh, the empty space, blue sky, blue ocean creators go in first in the creative process. And then, then the early adopters come in and, and help refine it. Then those, once they're seeing what's going on, they come in and add to it. And, and I find that teams are most effective when they follow their natural creative energy, whether they're a, um, a team of like-minded individuals are very or very different. So it's a real it's a real diversity of creative styles. Um, as far as how what size group, I do believe that, um, or I've experienced that groups of five to seven initially on um, creating the initial vision, it's easier than if you have a room of twenty people. You know, um, and if you, a lot of the uh, stories about the um, creators of big transformative businesses, it was usually two people, uh, one person or two, and then they, they 
ha uh, hammered out the vision and then maybe they brought in a team, a small team of three or four or five of them, they got a lot of it developed before bringing it in to the whole. Right, well that's actually my favorite thing about the work I do is because people, not everybody's necessarily a gifted artist, but um, in a certain way, but everybody is creative and everybody's infinitely creative. And they're creative in ways that um, historically may not be considered a creative. Um, some people are creative at developing software programs. Some people are creative at sales or how you communicate. Some people have multiple creative sparks. Um, so uh, the way it is, is to not, to be, um, not have the labels come from the outside first, not have it imposed. Well, you're the creative, you're the engineer, or you're the, you're the marketing person. So you're going to think like this, you're the, uh, engineer. So you're going to think like this, but to set up, um, experiences and activities and ways of connecting and interacting where people can reveal ways that they're creative and that people get to self-define and self-select what's engaging for them and what's alive for them and what they like to do because that's often most connected to their highest creative contribution. So a lot of it is getting away from external labels and letting people, going into discovery, going into discovery. So what emerges may be surprising so often you'll find in a group or in a team that somebody uh, didn't know somebody had these hidden skills or hidden talents or hidden drives and people do buy into what they help create. So the first thing I focus on is getting that out of them that what is it that they would even want to help create because that's often connected to what they're going to be good at and certainly engaged in. There's many messages but I think if I had to reduce it to core Thing is that don't for anybody individual group or team don't ever believe that you're not creative you are creative and you have a unique way of expressing yourself and just because it doesn't fit into a social construct or something that we were socialized in or educated in doesn't mean that you don't have infinite creativity to offer and so my message would be to give yourself space time and attention to engage it to play with it without needing um, a specific outcome, but go into discovery mode, be a discoverer around your own creative process and you, what will emerge will surprise you.